All right, welcome everybody to class seven, part one, where we're discussing a our context diagram and we are giving some more thought to it because it's very important because context is indeed always king. It always reigns. And so in the last video, we discussed the specific statement, specific verse that's under consideration of what we're studying. We consider, of course, the immediate context below, uh, above that verse and below the verse. And uh, it's very important to put that in its context. I think about, you know, examples like 1 Corinthians 15, 29. And um, uh, let me just give some several examples, several more examples of what I mean, even though we've already covered them. So just off the top of my head of what I'm thinking about. First Corinthians fifteen twenty-nine. So it says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? And it's very important to consider, okay, what's before this? What's after this? And as you can see, what Paul is doing is he's giving several arguments. And so first, as you can see here, um, you know, there were some who were saying, what were they saying? Well, if you read it carefully, it's how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So we're considering the immediate context and the sexual context, right? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty, Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. So you can see he's giving these implications of what, if, if it is the case that the general future resurrection body is not going to be raised, then Christ is not risen from the dead, and we have no hope. We're false witnesses. We're giving people false hope, and so on and so forth. And you know what? what that's why uh, when it comes to that 8070 doctrine, this is why you go to 1 Corinthians 15 and stand your ground because this chapter is a great stronghold against the 8070 uh, doctrine, the heresy that's being taught that everything happened in 8070. So um, that's something that we need to think about. So if, you, if the dead do not rise and Christ has not risen, if Christ has not risen, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And he goes on to talk about this. And and then I think it's really interesting how he talks about what then comes the end. What end? When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Now, you know, when we're talking about this 8070 doctrine, they say, well, this is referring to spiritual death. Okay, let's just take that to mean spiritual death. Okay, sin death. If that it truly happened in 8070, then friend, sin can't be committed today. That's the, that's the logical conclusion we have to come to, that sin cannot be committed, and therefore nobody's under sin, and therefore no one's in need of a savior. And so it just, it, the dominoes just fall over completely when people begin to teach this doctrine. So then Paul gives another argument here. And what he's trying to say here is not with regards to the proxy baptism uh, that, that Mormons teach. What he's saying is this word for here is hooper uh, in reference to so otherwise what will they do who are baptized in reference to the dead if the dead ones this is plural plural these are plural just i want to make that um, clear why then are they baptized in reference to the dead ones see paul's asking two good questions here he's saying to those corinthians okay uh, and to those who were uh, obviously the word they referring to those who denied the the future bodily resurrection so he's kind of he's saying this he's saying okay we know you and i know that we were baptized into christ 
Acts 18, 1 Corinthians 1 talks about that. Baptism is not just, um, it's not just uh, to, of course, it's not only to be washed by the blood of Jesus to, to receive salvation. That's not the only thing that baptism, uh, it doesn't just, it doesn't just show the death, uh, it imitate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, like Romans 6, 3, and 4. But it also points to something in the future, right? We know that we're, as, when we're baptized into Christ, we're raised to walk in newness of life. So we have that new life in Christ. But you see, you and I still have this body that needs to be redeemed. And when will it be redeemed? At the, re- at the resurrection of the last day when Jesus returns. And so he's saying, why then are you guys getting baptized? Because that's pointing to, uh, it's a precursor to the the future general bodily resurrection of the dead. So that's that's why he asked those questions. All right, so I just want to make that point there. This is, I mean, this is so very important. Um, In fact, we can go to the first part of this letter, right? 1 Corinthians 1, verse 15. You know, some people take these verses out of context, right? People will say, verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. And people, denominationalists, will take this verse, and they will run with it, and they will misapply it. And But you got to... Do what we always do. We got to look at the original statement, the immediate, the statement. It's being a specific statement that's being talked about. Look at the immediate context. And what's the immediate context? Well, the immediate context begins up here in verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say that this, that each of you says, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Paulus, and I'm of Cephas, or I'm of Christ. Now he, he starts to ask these really good questions, rhetorical questions. And in the Greek, it actually tells us um, the answer. Uh, if I were to take the Greek, yeah. This is really interesting. See here in the Greek, Memoristi ho Christos, and then may, may Paulus estai rothe huper human he est to anoma palu ebatistete. It's kind of hard to say, but notice this may here is the may actually demands a no answer. That's really that's what's really cool. It demands a no answer. So is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. Now, what's really interesting is, um, let's see, I'm trying to think of a, of a verse that actually demands a yes answer. Um, man caught me off guard ah can't think of one right now oh 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 i'll show you yeah let me show you yeah first corinthians 9 i'm not talking about first corinthians 9 1 sorry i want i want want to come back to this but this is this is part of the reason harmonetics original languages because you you can know the answer to to these these questions these questions so look at this i think this is kind of interesting so Paul says, let me make sure everybody can see this. I am, am I not an apostle? Now, in the Greek, it gives us the answer. It says, uke me apostolos. And see, it doesn't have the may. May demands a no answer. The u, oh, you here, it demands a yes answer. So, Am I not an apostle? Yes. Am I not free? Yes. Uh, am I? Uh, have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes. 
Are you not my work in the Lord? Yes. So I think that's really interesting there. Uh, that That's one of the really good ways of knowing, uh, of learning the original languages. Okay, so going back to 1 Corinthians. Sorry, I didn't mean to get off on that tangent. Well, that's not a tangent. <laughs> Just want to show what the Bible says, right? All right, so, so he says, it, it, so is Christ divided? No. Was Paul crucified for you? No. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. That's what he's talking about here. When he's talking about verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, meaning to administer, to, to be the administrator of baptism. That's what that means there. Christ didn't send him to administrate baptism. There are plenty of other people who could do that on behalf of Paul. And he says, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. See, Paul, he is guided directly by the Holy Spirit. So he's sent to preach the gospel. But there are others who can certainly uh, take the confession of a sinner and, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so this is not talking about that baptism is not part of the gospel. That is just sheer nonsense. Baptism is certainly a uh, part of the gospel of Christ. And because it contains, listen, what is the gospel? The death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Is it not? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And also, of course, see it, uh, those who saw the, 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 those eyewitnesses who saw the resurrected Christ. But then we got is a case where, um, so there's, there's the facts of the gospel. There's the commands of the gospel that we're to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And there's promises to be received. And what's the promise? To be receive the remission of sins. So uh, that's one of the things you we always need to do. Look at the context. Look at the context. Um, just the other day, studying with a, a Jehovah Witness. I'll show you something that I showed, I showed her. I said to her, okay, when you look at John 12, 37, 38. I'm going to make this so you can see it here. All right, John 12, 37, 38. But although he, uh, pronoun, right? And we're, we're going to talk about um, the parts of speech because those are very, very, very important. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Now, who's the he and him? It's Jesus. There's no doubt about that. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? No doubt that's from Isaiah 53. Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, now notice this, where, where is this quoted from? Isaiah chapter 6. I want to show you something interesting enough in regards to this. Um, I'll, just, I'll just use this. All right, so. Oh, oops. Okay. I can't go to the other verse. Ah. Never mind. I, I wish I could go to, uh, I need to learn how to do that <laughs> or remember how I did that. That's okay though. I could, yeah. Yeah, let me just do it this way. Show you all this way. Okay. So Isaiah 6, right? He has blinded their eyes, hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts, and turn so that I should heal them. Now notice this. This is very, very, very important. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Who's the his? Jesus. Who is him? Jesus. 
Now you go to Isaiah 6. Notice this. What does is, what is Isaiah see? I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And then he, the seraphim, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Yahweh of hosts. The hope. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah saw this. Isaiah, Isaiah saw his glory. And what does he say? For woe is me, for I am undone, because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And then notice down here, Verse 9 and 10, which is quoted in John 12, right? Now, somebody, somebody, Jehovah Witness might say, well, but uh, yeah, Jesus has glory, but that doesn't make him Yahweh. Well, interesting enough, when you read about the word glory, I want to show you in Isaiah something very interesting. Uh, Isaiah 40. Yeah, look at this. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. See, Jesus is Yahweh. The Father is Yahweh. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh. There is one God, yet three persons. And so we just need to understand that fact. All right. Um, I think I dwelt with that enough, I hope. Uh, I, lo I love giving examples, though. I think it's just, you know, very, very important. All right. So that's why it's very important to look at the immediate context sectional context, even the other books, right? And that's what we did. We looked at John 12. We noticed it went to Isaiah 6. We all, so Isaiah 53. And we had to put it all together by using the whole Bible. So it's just very, very important to recognize that, right? Can't stress that enough. All right. Now, here's another important thing is looking at literary context literary well what do we mean by literary well you we gotta recognize is it a epistle is it poetry is it narrative now sometimes it's a case that uh, uh, you have a combination of some so I'm about to teach the book of Revelation when you think about Revelation is it an epistle yes is it apocalyptic literature yes so, so then to consider, well, poetry. Well, when I think about poetry, is there poetry in the prophetic books? Yeah, uh, just Isaiah itself. Uh, there's, there's some poetry. Psalms. Um, but what about narrative? Yeah, narrative is very important. Uh, historical narrative, knowing that, you know, this, um, these are real time space events that occurred. And, you know, the one things that we're facing today is uh, there'll be, you know, some people who will say, for example, uh, take Genesis 1 and 2. That's a battleground today. And they'll say, well, see, it's, it's poetry. No, 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 no. It's not poetry. It's, in fact, uh, a historical narrative. That's what it is. Now, is there poetry in Genesis? Yeah, there is. But we know that we can recognize it, the historical narrative. Okay, and there, and there are certain things that, that signal to us what it is. Um, so I, I find that to be very, very important. All right, words are important. Words. Yep, words are definitely very important. I want to look at Matthew 
21 through 46. Matthew 22, 41 through 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day, or did anyone dare question him anymore. Uh, now, I find that, you know, very, very important, right? Now, what is, what's he referring to? Well, he's referring to, and I want to look at it. I hate when this is lower than okay. Mm -hmm. So he's referring to the famous passage of Psalm one ten. Psalm one ten is one of those psalms that's quoted very frequently in the New Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Why does David call him Lord? Interesting, right? How is he, how is the Messiah going to be the son of David if David calls him Lord? And no one dared try to answer it, did they? Well, it's very simple, right? Very easy to understand because we know, the, of course, the, we have the rest of the Bible, but it's very important to consider the the importance of just one word that Jesus uses. <clears throat> All right, so let's look at, so David, right? Got David. He is going to be the uh, ancestor of the Messiah, right? Son of David. The answer correctly on that, we know in 2 Samuel seven twelve, God had promised him. We, we went through this covenant with David. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Now, then we talked about the immediate context being Solomon, but the ultimate context being Jesus, the Messiah. And then we go to Psalm 110.1, 1, The Lord said to my Lord, so that my right hand tell make your enemies your footstool. And notice, once again, that, that they that Jesus really points to that one word. And that's very that's why words are important. So I love how Jesus, the master teacher, makes a great argument here. He says, Okay, how how is the Messiah going to be the son of David if David calls him Lord, that he's deity? Well, there's only one way. And that Jesus was born of Mary the Virgin, and he came down in a human body, and he's, he's still deity. So that's very, very important to realize that. So that's why it's so very important when we're studying words. Now, rule number so rule number one, we would need to consider the context. Context is king. Rule number two, interpret according to the correct meaning of words. Words are vehicles of communication, symbols by which we transfer ideas. God used words to communicate his will. All right? Think about the meaning of some different English words. Think about the word I got here, run. If I were to say to you, I'm, I'm, ru I'm running on the track, well, that's usually the uh, one way of saying, okay, he is exercising, right? Um, but if I were to say I'm running out of time, 
uh, or um, uh, well, I'm trying to think of some other ways in which the word run is used. Uh, it has 30 different definitions. Uh, in fact, let's just look at them. Let's just look at this. I think there's, I know the word set has um, brother Eric Lyons said there's over 200 definitions. So I got. I need. I want to look this up. Word oh oh dictionary.com. So let's look at dictionary.com. The word run. Um gotta let me show it to you guys. Um yeah, here we go. Yeah. Okay. To move with haste, act quickly, which is the way I was. I'm running. I'm run. Run the track, right? Um, to move or run along early every morning, he ran the dirt path around the reservoir to keep in condition. She ran her fingers over the keyboard to traverse in distance. He ran the mile in just over four minutes. Of course, I did that right. Um. Oh, here we go. To perform, compete in, or accomplish by or as by running, to go about freely on or in without supervision, for many children to run the streets, to rise or cause a gallop, to run a horse across the field, to enter in a race. He ran his best filly in the Florida Derby, to bring into a certain state by running. He ran himself out of breath trying to keep pace, to trace, track, pursue, or hunt as game, to run deer on foot. <laughs> so as you can see, what uh, to manage or conduct? Yeah, I'm running a business. <laughs> so, um, to expose oneself or be exposed to. So, as you can see, we got quite a few definitions here. Um, so, I just wanted to show, I think that's kind of interesting how the word run is used. Um, going back. All right, so if you translate a word the same way every time you run across it in Scripture, <laughs> notice that you run across it in Scripture, right? You will come up with some far-out interpretations. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples here, okay? So the Greek word cosmos, what can it mean, okay? We're going to look at it. Let's look at how it's used in the Bible. Okay, so we're going to go back. I'm going to put in the word world. I'm just going to look at the New Testament usage, if that'd be all right. Okay. So the word world, how is it used? Okay, so for example, Jesus says, You're the lie of the world, a seed that is set on the hill that cannot be hidden. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. Oh, yeah, let, me, let me go ahead and put the Greek word so I can make sure that we're... Um, yeah, uh... Okay, see, that's a different Greek word, ionos. Okay, let me look at here. Yeah, cosmu, okay. Cosmu, Matthew 5, 14. Um, foundation of the world. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, I will say, and I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. So I'm just trying to show you that the word world is used quite a bit in, in different ways. For what prophet is it? to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for a soul? Of course, it's not talking about 
people there, right? It's talking about in the sense of if you focus on the system of this world, materialism, um, everything that you know that's associated with uh, only this transitory life, and you focus on that, then you're going to miss out. Okay, um, and this is interesting. Matthew twenty four fourteen. Ah, see, we have another Greek word, oko mene. I uh, don't want to say, as you can see, we have different Greek words. Um, I'm trying to think of it. So, Mark, yeah, this is one of the best ones to me. Mark 16, 15, 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Okay. Go into all the world. Okay, so I think you can see there that we're to preach to lost sinners, people who are in the world, and bring them into the kingdom of Christ. Um, look at another way. First, I think First John two. Uh, I love how John's gospel. John focuses on the word world a lot. So, for example. Here in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Of course, He's not talking about the the planet uh, that we're moving on, right? He's talking about the people. That's what He's talking about. For God did not send His Son. He's talking about this world that is hostile towards God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and the men love darkness rather than the light. All right, so going a little bit further. How else is it used? Well, we know that it's used, uh, go to 1 John 2, 15 through 17, where he uses it in the same way. So let's look at that. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Yeah. Do not, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the flesh is, uh, for all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And these are not of the Father, but of the war, is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Now the Bible does teach us that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, we're to love people. So certainly it's not, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. We recognize that we are to love people, but we don't love what they do. We don't love their sin. And this is the worldly system, right? So that's why it's very important to look at the context of things. All right, going back. So what can world mean? Let me make this smaller. It can mean the planet on which we live, mankind in general. Man who lives in rebellion against God. So that's that's an example. Right. So, and then there's the word death, the natos. Well, what can it mean? Well, depending on where you're looking in the context, the physical separation of the soul and body, Hebrews 9, 27. Spiritual separation between God and man. You're, you're dead and you're trespassing in sins. Eternal separation in hell. Uh, those who experience the second death. There's also Matthew 24, 34, like the word generation. So that's very important to look at that, that 
uh, that's referring to the destruction of Jerusalem and that all the signs would take place before this generation would pass away, which the generation would be about 40 years. So it's very, very, very important that we look at the context. Well, I appreciate being with y'all today. Uh, I want to continue this in our next segment. Um, I hope soon. Thank you so much. Have a good day.